Do humans have souls? Cutting edge science and robotics. Artificial intelligence. Neurobiology. And psychology are closing in on an answer to a question that has obsessed humanity since its beginnings. Is there something that survives the body? Is there something that's beyond the physical? Adrian Owen is one of the world's leading neuroscientists. He works with people in vegetative states who are less behaviorally functional than Ishiguro's robots. He thinks he may have found something. Until recently, neuroscientists were only able to study the brains of dead people. But in the past 20 years, technological advancements have made it possible for them to study the brains of the living. I work at the uh, MRC, uh, Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit in Cambridge. I've been doing brain imaging for nearly 20 years. And I spent many years doing what we call brain mapping studies in, in healthy volunteers, scanning people, doing things like remembering, looking at perceiving things, and uh, working out which, which bits of the brain were involved in those tasks. I think soul and mind are interchangeable, and I think, as a neuroscientist, mind and brain are interchangeable. Our mind is uh, a product of the complex brain that we have. Um, I think the reason we feel that we all have a soul and my soul is different to your soul is because my brain is different to your brain. So whereas for Ishiguro, humans are defined by their external behaviors, for Owen, we can reduce our essence to our brain. But what about people whose behavior is compromised and brains are damaged? And with consciousness, you have a, a big problem that the, the only way I can tell you that I am conscious is through some sort of action, either by you know, telling you or by demonstrating. You know, if you take something like so-called disorders of consciousness, vegetative state, minimally conscious state, you don't have those things with uh, some of these patients. They're, they are, by definition, unable to produce the sorts of responses that the rest of us would use to demonstrate that we were conscious. Scott, yes or no, were you a fireman? For Dr. Owen, what began as a simple study of consciousness turned into an unprecedented discovery. In the course of his work, a 23-year-old woman in a vegetative state, responded to his instructions. And he captured the moment. She was the victim of um, a road traffic accident um, and had been examined periodically for five months. And um, on each examination had all of the uh, necessary criteria for a, a diagnosis of vegetative state. So we put her in an fMRI scanner and uh, we asked her to imagine playing a game of tennis. In this scan, when you hear the word tennis, I want you to imagine standing on a tennis court playing a game of tennis. We picked this task because it's something that we've, we've tried many times in healthy volunteers, and we know this produces quite a specific activation in an area in the middle of the front of the brain called the supplementary motor area. Uh, and this area controls uh, upper body movements, and if you lie in the scanner and imagine moving your body around as you would if you were playing a game of tennis. You get very strong activation in this area of the brain. Um, so while she was in the scanner, we instructed her that when she heard the word tennis, we'd like her to start imagining this task and carry on until we said rest. And when we did this, her brain activated just like a healthy volunteer. That was pretty exciting. Um, we had uh, another task that we used. It was, it was important to show that this wasn't just an, an automatic reaction, but if we changed the task, the brain activation would change. So we used a type of spatial navigation task uh, where we asked her to imagine moving from room to room in her house. And this pretty much always activates an area um, deep inside the brain called the parahippocampal gyrus. 
um, in healthy volunteers. Never seen it before in a vegetative patient, but nonetheless, when we asked her to imagine moving from room to room in her house, the parahippocampal gyrus activated just as it would in a healthy volunteer. So um, there are many things we could conclude from that. She clearly understood language because she understood what we were asking her to do. She could recall how to play tennis. Um, and she could turn those instructions into a response, uh, not a physical response, such as a movement or speech, but a, a brain response exactly uh, when we asked her to do so. So on this basis, we concluded that she wasn't vegetative at all. She was uh, entirely consciously aware. But if the brain is damaged, what exactly is responding to Dr. Owen's instructions? What part of the patient is aware? And is a vegetative consciousness the same as ours? My interest is probably not what consciousness is, but rather where the borders are between what most of us would think of as being a conscious state and what most of us would agree is an unconscious state. Similarly, uh, with anesthesia, I'm very interested to know what it is that turns off awareness or consciousness as we go into an anesthetized state. So it's where the borders are that intrigues me rather than try to answer what consciousness is itself. What and who is activating the vegetative brain? By exploring the region between consciousness and unconsciousness, scientists may have discovered a way to bring us face to face with the soul.